मेरे को याद है Hello and welcome to another episode of Impressions of America. I'm Simon and with me as always is Toby. Hi Toby. Hi Simon. Today's episode is the third part of our Richard Nixon trilogy and looks at the Watergate scandal that defined not only Nixon's legacy but also the political landscape of the time. And to aid us with this episode is friend of the show, playwright and screenwright and fellow Nixon lover Justin Sharon. You may know him uh, you may know Justin by another persona that's Dick underscore Nixon on Twitter. Hello, Justin. Thanks for joining us. Hello there. It's my pleasure. In the early hours of June 17, 1972, police apprehended five men in the office of the Democratic National Committee in Washington, D.C., at the Watergate complex. The burglars, who included James McCord and Bernard Barker, were connected to President Nixon's re-election campaign and had been caught wiretapping phones and stealing documents. The Washington Post reported that the police found lockpicks and door jimmies, over $2,000 in cash, most of it in $100 bills, a shortwave receiver that could pick up police calls, 40 rolls of unexposed film, two 35mm cameras, and three pen-sized tear gas guns. Nixon's attempts to cover up his involvement in this crime over the next two years were ultimately uh, futile and his resignation happened on August 9th, 1974. The main focus of this episode will be on the cover-up by Nixon and his staff, but let's start by setting the scene. Toby, can you give us some greater context to the 72 election and events prior to the break-in? Well, the 1972 election was an absolute unprecedented victory for Richard Nixon. He was re-elected, winning... Almost every state apart from Massachusetts and the District of Columbia, it was an overwhelming victory over George McGovern, who in many ways was a a far left candidate who had no real purchase over the American public. So and and Nixon also possessed a foreign policy record to be pretty much admired, as we covered in Nixon in China. Nixon had created rapprochement with China. He had um, initiated the SALT treaties with with the Soviet Union. He was well on his way to ending the Vietnam War. This is a a president that was quite substantial and very, very popular at the beginning of this period. Great. And as far as the events leading up to the break-in, can can either of you kind of give a sense of why Nixon felt he required such events to take on the Democratic Party, considering only a few months later he won in such a landslide? I think it had, it had has a lot to do with Nixon's paranoia. Nixon had lost 1960 by a very, very close margin, and he always felt that the JFK campaign had used the mafia in Chicago to st- basically to steal the election. He was incredibly paranoid about losing this election. And the, actually, the people around him had developed an almost like boilerplate mentality. They saw liberalism and the McGovern campaign as really it was almost like an existential threat to the present order. They saw it as, you know, the the, the society that, that they had all grew up in, this was sort of the society of the white pig offenses was being unraveled by all these the, all these liberals. And the McGovern um, 1972 convention, which for the first time allowed a lot of groups that had been marginalized to really have an really have an influence in the process, was really a spectacle, and it it, it sort of evinced this 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 image of a of a of a party that reflected parts of society that that they felt were really anathema to, to what they believed in. So. For them, it wasn't just the political election; it was it was religion almost. And so, they tried everything they could to try to have Richard Nixon win the election. And they they tried things like, you know, implying fake stories about the the strongest candidate. Because actually, in 1972, Edmund Muskie was polling quite close to Richard Nixon. So what they did is they they sort of implied some fake stories that about Edmund Muskie's wife 
which led to Ed Muskie crying in front of the cameras, which completely shattered his prospects as a presidential candidate. They also planted spies in the in the Ted Kennedy within Ted Kennedy's staff. They shot out lights at McGovern um, the McGovern meetings. They bugged people. They they eventually bugged the the Watergate to try to get some information on, on the the leader of the Democratic Party at the time, Larry Larry O'Brien, especially because O'Brien was linked to some money from the financer uh, Howard Hughes. So for, for them, it was it wasn't just a normal election. The the the, the community to reelect the president was set up. Because these people, people like Liddy, people like Hunt, who really, in some ways, were not conventional um, staffers. I mean, you had people like Holden and Ehrlichman who had been, you know, his government, normal government officials. Liddy had come from the FBI, but he he, he was a, a person with quite odd views. He believed in sort of almost like a Nietzschean will to power. He 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 was known for putting his hand in front of flames. And people ask, oh, well, how, what's the trick? And he would say, the trick is not to care about it. You know, he was, he, was quite, he was quite a loon. And Hunt had come out of the CIA and actually had been involved in the Bay of, Bay of Pigs, Bay of Pigs scandal. So you had two sort of loose cannons who in many ways were, I think in, in many ways Nixon was sort of insulated from them because the, 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 the community to re-elect the president was run by the former attorney general, uh, John Mitchell and Mitchell, in in and actually in a sort of a loose way, had uh, delegated um, to Magruder, and Magruder had had sort of um, any any schemes that Mitchell at, would would sort of come up with. He would run by Liddy. Liddy would come up with some other schemes. He, he had schemes involving prostitutes to send prostitutes to the Democratic Convention in order to, you know, incriminate all these Democratic politicians. So they were constantly coming up with harebrained schemes. It was just part of a general dirty tricks uh, institution that they had they had set up, and this was sort of the context for the eventual bumbling at the Watergate, which actually was the third attempt to burgle the Watergate. I- initially, they, had, they hadn't they had really got any information from Larry O'Brien. They, they had actually had a drawer where they kept all the intelligence on the Democrats. And they sort of looked at the stuff they were getting from Larry O'Brien, which was all like functional stuff. It wasn't any, it wasn't anything like saucy. And it didn't, it, it really didn't come out it really wasn't worth the, the money they had put into it. So they, they went back to try to do it again. And one of the worst things Liddy did was to have um, McCord, who was actually the head of security for the committee to re-elect the president, involved in the burglary itself. If I could um, interject with a little bit of that. Uh, One thing that it's really important to understand about President Nixon, uh, uh, two things, in fact, was that he prided himself on working harder uh, uh, than everyone else. That's how he got uh, where he did. And he always felt out of place. Um, He was a poor kid from California in the halls of power, which were mostly populated by Ivy League people like Jack Kennedy. And uh, he felt in 1960 uh, that he had been outworked. The uh, the Kennedys are not only in the uh, the incidents of uh, dead people voting in Chicago, etc. He... (laughs) He 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 felt that the, the Kennedys had ha, had outworked him, and he resolved after 1960 that he would never be outworked in anything ever again. And um, it's important to note that uh, I don't really say this with sympathy. It's uh, uh, just as a matter of fact. It's not really paranoia if they're not out to get you. I mean, they were very much out to get him at. 
every turn. Uh, and in in 72, he resorted to tactics that were not at all new. I mean, they had been employed by the Kennedys, they'd been employed by Johnson, etc. But and Nixon turned them up to 11. Uh, he it, it did them to an extent that uh, had at that point been unequaled in uh, American politics. He didn't invent them, but he pushed them uh, into nasty new territory. That's very interesting. So could we maybe just move uh, forward just a little bit to the post post breaking events and some of the key players involved? So we have Holderman, John Dean, Liddy and Hunt. And can we just maybe explain some of the events post the break in and the event that those four men played in, in the in the events that followed? I think in the immediate term of Liddy and Hunt, they got away before they were in, you know, because actually they left loads of stuff. They'd left checks, they'd left money, they'd left some of the, the equipment in the hotel because they, you know, they they just scrambled out of there, so the FBI were able to eventually catch up on them. But I think Liddy went back to the community to reelect the president. He talked to he talked to Dean. He talked to Mitchell, and so Mitchell and Dean were immediately sort of ensconced in in this um, in this cover up. And then eventually Hunt and Liddy were sort of taken and. And 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 I think at that point, then. But actually, initially for Nixon, it was it was a peripheral issue. Nixon really didn't take control of it until maybe until after the election. So at, at this point, it was an issue for Mitchell and Dean. And 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 Dean was an interesting character because. Dean was a, was a very young man. He was in his early 30s and he had been evol- involved with the committee to re-elect the president as a sort of like a, a legal liaison. And But from the moment that, the, that Liddy and Hunt were taken in, he basically became the point man. Holderman and er- Ehrlichman, when they would go to Nixon and sort of inform him about the, the, the little things that were happening with the, the, the cases of Hunt and Liddy, he, Nixon soon figured out that they were getting all of their information from John Dean. And so Nixon brought in John Dean to have a conversation with Gene, Dean in order to find out really what was happening. And, and, he, and, and actually in the, in the immediate pre- period, Nixon felt that John Dean had actually handled the, the case really well he had provided the financial assistance for for the the, the burglars uh, and uh, Hunt and Liddy. It was very, very, very important to do so because actually so, soon they, they needed money f- to pay off legal fees. And, 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 and John Dean was, was, was actually did that incredibly well. But, and, and I think in, in the immediate term into probably into September, there was a sense in which the John Dean was actually working with the FBI while the FBI was doing the investigation and the FBI was led by a guy called uh, L. Patrick Gray. Patrick Gray was allowing John Dean into the meetings, into some of these interviews with people like Liddy and Mitchell. And there's, there was a sense in which that John Dean, who had actually worked in Congress, was the point man for all the whole Watergate investigation. And L. Patrick Gray, who was the director of the FBI, he wasn't permanent director. He had to be um, brought in as permanent director just a, a little later on in, in, in his hearings. But while he, he, in his capacity, he was actually burying a lot of the information that was coming out. So the FBI, although the FBI had interviewed everyone, they were not, because L. Patrick Gray and John Dean were basically surrogates for the White House, they were not able to uncover all of the information that they required to take this investigation forward. So 
the people who were initially sentenced, the, the, the four burglars, Hunt and Liddy, it, it seemed in the immediate term like those were the only people who were going to be in trouble for this issue. But it wasn't until L. Patrick Gray had to be brought in for his own confirmation hearings that he told, you know, the, the, the committees that he, he, he was actually been working with, with Dean and that, that the White House had said that, and when they asked questions about Watergate, L. Patrick Gray had to tell them that the White House had told him that he couldn't say anything about Watergate. So it was, a, the, so the, it was clear that the initial investigation had been completely usurped by John Dean and the White House, and that L. Patrick Gray was just, even though in his capacity as the, the, the head of the FBI, was just the surrogate of the White House. In fact, when Nixon was talking to Haldeman initially about this, he felt that there was a possibility of actually ha having the CIA shut down the, the FBI investigation by telling the members of the CIA, people like Richard, Richard Helms, that if they looked into Hunt and some of the, the, the Cuban burglars, that it would bring up the Bay of Pigs thing. Pigs thing. And the leaders of the CIA were completely apoplectic when, they, when the, the White, White House came to send them. This. They was like, this had nothing to do with the Bay of Pigs. But they still went to the FBI and, and tried to sort of muscle or you know, shove them out of their investigation by saying that actually if you, if you look into this more, you might uncover things that are issues of national security. Um, a couple of things in there, and I apologize if I'm uh, uh, covering ground that you've already covered, but uh, it's important, I think, uh, to understand that Richard Nixon uh, uh, did not order the uh, Watergate a uh, break in uh, uh, personally. There's no evidence. Mm -hmm. There's there's also there's uh, no evidence he he uh, personally ordered any of the uh, political espionage operations at all. The the plumbers. Uh, as uh, they were called, um, were an operation uh, 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 set up by uh, Bud Crow and John Mitchell and, and David Young, and their uh, purpose was to be a uh, separate um, uh, uh, but a related entity that would uh, go after uh, Richard Nixon's uh, political enemies. And uh, he had expectations of them, but he had no oversight of them. Uh, and that was the whole reason why John Dean was there. Uh, John Dean was a White House counsel, uh, which is the president's public lawyer, mm -hmm. uh, not, uh, uh, not his personal lawyer. The uh, White House counsel's job is to ensure that the a president remains uh, within the law and that he enforces the law in the proper way. And of course, um, Dean, in a personal sense, was a really bad guy. Um, his <laughs> his first job as a lawyer uh, was to negotiate a, a television and radio a license for his client. And um, seeing that this license was up for a bid, uh, instead of working in good faith for his client, he bid for the license himself. <laughs> um, the only reason why he was not disbarred, and that is an offense that would uh, get you uh, disbarred almost anywhere in the United States, was that uh, this occurred in the Washington uh, uh, this occurred, excuse me, in the Washington, D.C. bar. And uh, if their standards are famously lax uh, because if they uh, uh, disbarred people for um, uh, serious offenses, there would be no lawyers left in Washington. <laughs> uh, so he then went to work for, I believe it was Barry Goldwater, uh, his... Goldwater's son had been a school friend of of, of Dean's, and uh, although Goldwater had had no truck with the politics of of that type, uh, Dean became known on Capitol Hill as as a 
down and dirty guy who would, you know, would do anything to get on and uh, take bullets for his boss. So that is why he was brought into the White House. Um, uh, uh, Patrick Gray, of course, was Nixon's stooge at the FBI. Uh, he he was uh, brought in after the uh, death of uh, J. Edgar Hoover, um, who uh, on 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 hearing of Hoover's death, uh, Nixon's reaction uh, was, I he said I I think he said, my God, uh, that old cocksucker. <laughs> make of that what you will um and uh the job should have gone by rights to mark felt who had been uh jagger who was number two uh his his other uh, number two at uh, the fbi his first number two was his boyfriend clyde tolson uh but um Mark Felt was the was the uh, uh, a career G man mm-hmm. who, who worked at at Hoover's side, and um, by rights the job should have gone to him. And uh, Nixon did not uh, give him the job uh, because he was a a career G man whose loyalty was to the FBI. Mm-hmm. Um, Primarily, and uh, Nixon knew he he couldn't trust that, so he uh, uh, he uh, gave Gray uh, the job, uh, who who he could boss around, and uh, that is the reason why we have Deep Throat. Yeah. So for some context, there, as Justin said, in May second, seventy two, Edgar Hoover dies, and of course we get we get Gray as the uh, acting FBI director appointed rather than. Uh, Rather than someone else who might be, as as Justin says, more loyal to the uh, FBI itself rather than to the the wants and needs of Richard Nixon, I'd also like to point out that although we're talking, you know, as if these events played out, August thirtieth, nineteen seventy two, Nixon announced that John Dean has completed an in- internal investigation into the Watergate break in and has found no evidence of White House involvement. So I think really we should probably just end the podcast there and just say that. Everything after August 1972 is completely unfounded, as far as one I'm of the concerned. greatest presidents in the history of uh, America. Yep, no, no scandal to see here. I think if, uh, if Nixon announced it, I'm, I'm going to take his word for it. So, um, uh, or we could continue the podcast, either or. But I just want to put the asterisk out there that Nixon in August 30, in August 30th 72 said there was there was no issue. So I, I'm going to take the great man on his word. Um, as far as the initial strategy of dealing with the break-in you were saying that really that that wasn't sort of Nixon, Nixon himself who's, who's involved in that can we talk a little bit more about the the role that the FBI and the CIA play in both the investigation and the cover-up we've touched on a little bit already well I would say that it's it's really through L. Patrick Gray that the 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 FBI investigation is sort of like is is not allowed to go into the territories that that it that it that it should have been. Mm-hmm. I, I think that the use of the CIA was primary. I think I think there's a, if you were to take someone like um, McCord for example, McCord actually had been a CIA agent, and McCord um, he was very unhappy with the fact that they were going to say that the CIA was involved. So for him, he, he sort of stewed for a long time. And part of the reason why McCord eventually flips and, and wrote his, his letter to the judge was that he, he thought that the Nixon administration was going to use the CIA and say that it was a CIA issue. And so the, the, the Nixon administration sort of used its leverage with the Justice Department, with the FBI and with the CIA to block... The, the 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 real investigation so you had you had um, Woodward and Bernstein who were you know actually through through the use of Mark Felt who were actually uh, getting out information about these issues and they were and and they when they would go to the FBI and find out if the FBI knew about these things the FBI would say yeah we, we know about about these issues but but we're not prosecuting them so there's a sense in which the FBI investigation was scuppered by the fact that the Nixon administration had into, you know, in, in a connection with all of these these different administrations. 
Uh, Justin, anything you wish to add on the FBRCIA, or would you like to move on? Um, I think it's worth considering how hostile the CIA especially was to President Nixon, and that is Nixon's own fault. Um, mm. He he uh, 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 made a point from his first days in office of um, of sidelining Richard Helms, the uh, the very famous, really infamous um, a director of the CIA, uh, who has pro- was probably involved in more bad things than anyone who's ever lived. Um, uh, he he froze the CIA out of a direct contact with the other uh, president. All all intelligence reports were uh, directed through Henry Kissinger. And um, Helms did not like being treated uh, uh, like a second-class citizen. Uh, and um, uh, 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 then in uh, uh, the period of, of the of, uh, uh, first term, Helms stewed and stewed and stewed. And then uh, in, in 1972, um, uh, uh, Nixon was uh, reelected, and he 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 just he just fired everyone. He swept everyone out, um, including Helms, uh, which went back on Nixon's initial promise to Helms that the uh, director of the CIA was not to be uh, uh, considered a, a a political appointment. Um, so. Helms and everyone loyal to him at the CIA were extremely hostile to President Nixon in the first place. And then Nixon fired everybody. So um, Helms, uh, he lost his job. He was uh, made ambassador to Iran as a consolation prize. Um, And um, Nixon's hostility towards the CIA the intelligence services uh, cannot be uh, discounted when you look at the speed uh, with which the the leaks... uh, 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 I'm going to try saying that again. Uh, Nixon's hostility towards the intelligence services cannot be discounted when you uh, look at the speed of the the leaks against Nixon and how uh, they came thick and fast mm-hmm. uh, uh, later on. That uh, uh, They had no loyalty to him whatsoever. Right. So just looking at the timeline of events then, in November of 72, we know Nixon wins in essentially a landslide o- over McGovern. But by January 73, we have the, the Watergate break-in trials begin and we have Liddy and McCord uh, convicted for their roles in the break-in. Could, uh, could we talk a little bit more just about the, the initial trial itself and how that, how that kind of played out? The trial, I mean, what, what happened was that you had um, Liddy, Hunt, and the, the other burglars. They, they basically perjured themselves. They, they, they went in there, they had a story that was set up by, the, by John Dean, and they they lied about you know their their about their 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 actions in this. And then you had Magruder, who who was schooled by John Dean in his trial to lie essentially to perjure himself. Um, they they didn't say that he was going to do that, but basically John Dean um, he he knew all the questions that the 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 the, the that they were going to give Magruder and he basically schooled him and then Magruder went there and lied. And I think that after afterwards, Nixon told Dean that he had handled it fantastically. He said it was a can of worms. He didn't want to be at, he, he told uh, Dean that he would, he, he was really happy not to be Edward Bennett Williams right now, because after this was all cleared up, we're going to put a significant amount of pressure on, on him. We've got, we've got dirt on him and we're going to hurt him. 
we've got um, we're going to put a significant amount of pressure on the Washington Post. We're going to try to weaken their their television station and that that and sort of and that their income income stream coming from that. And he ba- he was he basically felt incredibly confident about what had happened. The the stonewalling and the the perjury had got them through those initial uh, trials. But it wasn't until the death of Hunt's wife, I think, in in the plane crash, where it was discovered that she had had um, she had had several hundred dollar bills in her purse. That it, it, you know it was it was clear that the, the the that the trial that they had had for the burglars was not you know completely above board, and then Hunt started to put pressure on the White House. He started to say that he was going to reveal things that Ehrlich, John Ehrlichman had done. And once once you get John Ehrlich, John John Ehrlichman's domestic advisor for Richard Nixon. And you know what Ehrlich, and Ehrlichman and Holderman were known as the Berlin Wall, so they sort of knew everything that each other knew. So it it, it was clear at that point that if if Ehrlichman was was brought under that, that could lead to the president. And um, Hunt told Dean that he wanted a hundred and hundred and twenty two thousand um, pounds for him and for his family for his children yesterday. And so once once that happened, Dean went to Nixon and told told Nixon that there was a cancer close to the presidency. It it it, it compounds itself. It grows in 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 geometric terms. People are going to start to perjure themselves. And Dean was so scared at that point that he he told Nixon that maybe we should start thinking about, you know, exposing this uh, conspiracy because, you know, it, it might threaten, threaten the, pre- the presidency. I, I should add that um, uh, 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 President Nixon, in, in the case of uh, Hunt in particular, I believe he assented to the paying of blackmail. Uh, he is on tape saying... Um, quite famously, uh, you could get a million dollars. I know where it uh, could be gotten. And he talks about laundering the, the money in, 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 in Las Vegas of all places. Also, um, what broke it open is that these, these men, the burglars, they were expecting pardons uh, or or at, at, at least clemency, and they they didn't get it. Um, it, it Nixon s- said in public uh, pretty early in the case that um, to grant clemency would be wrong. And this is a parallel that we're seeing in President Trump uh, uh, right now, I mean, he has no qualms about um, about offering pardons and 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 a clemency to his henchmen, but um, that is one thing that Richard Nixon would not do. Uh, but it his refusal to stand by his men, as it were, uh, who broke the the, the uh, other case wide open and. Um, one of the burglars uh, was James McCord, uh, who was another ex-CIA man. Um, he he was one of the first uh, burglars to go down, and uh, he almost immediately wrote to um, the a uh, federal judge in charge of the in, in, invest, in charge of the investigation, and uh, he admitted that he he had uh, perjured himself in court and that he had done so at the uh, a direction of uh, John Mitchell and John Dean. So 73 was quite a big year as far as, as this is concerned. We have quite a few events. Um, an, an important event to talk about is the Senate Watergate Committee. Could we uh, discuss that a little bit and the events leading to its formation and its role around some of the key figures of, of Nixon? Sure. 
uh, Toby or Justin, what would you? How would you like to start on this? We've got so April 9th, seventy three. We've got New York Times reporting that McCord uh, told the Senate Watergate Committee that um, a Republican group, I uh, creep, had made cash payments to the the Watergate burglars, and then Justin, uh, sorry, Patrick Gray resigns in seventy three uh, later in April, and then. We have um, we have resignations falling of of kind of some other key figures. Would you like to go into that first, or would you like to go into uh, the, the the May seventeenth uh, opening of, of the Senate Select Committee on the on these things? How how would you like to start? I would say that initially, when um, the the Select Committee was created in February, obviously there was a sense in which that they they had. There had been this 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 um, financial link between uh, John Mitchell and John Dean with, and then L. Patrick Gray had obviously mentioned that uh, John Dean had sat through all of the FBI investigations, and John Dean was was routinely getting intel from the FBI about the investigation. His name is popping up. John Dean's name is popping up everywhere. So people who are concerned about this issue realize that John Dean is essentially managing this. So John Dean goes from Nixon's point man on Watergate to someone who himself is seeking to uh, get a lawyer and to comply with the in- investigators. So there, there's a, a point in which Nixon has to think, okay, now Dean is moving into the clutches of the investigators. How does Dean have me implicated in the the Watergate, um, just the, in this Watergate mine? And then Nixon has to think back to himself, and he doesn't completely think about it clearly, but he realizes, okay, there was that point where Dean asked me about some money, and uh, and I said jokingly. You know, he Nixon makes the he self reflects and said, "Well, I said jokingly that you, there's a the place where you can get it." And he's talking to Holderman, and Holderman is trying to ask him, you know, like what what does Dean have necessarily have on you? And and Nixon thinks, you know, this is what Dean has on me, but it's it's nothing. It's 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 not enough." And then at the, in in May, when once the the Senate um sort of the Senate committee starts um, having its hearings, Nixon and his team go from the this, this stonewalling and sort of the, the giving out money to trying to frame the whole Watergate um, issue as really Dean's fault. But they also realize pretty early on that they have to cut off members of the team, including Holderman and Ehrlichman. Holderman himself was linked because Gordon Strom was his man at the committee to re-elect the, the president, and Holderman obviously, through conversations with Nixon, had been involved in um, constructing the cover-up himself. So Holderman and Ehrlichman are fired, and but Nixon rehires them in a secret way as, as uh, White House consultants just to help him out in the in the inter- intervening period. The star witness of the Senate uh, Watergate hearings, of course, is Dean. And how Dean gets there is that um, in March in March 1973, uh, it, 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 it Nixon realizes he he needs a fall guy, as Toby alluded to. And uh, he invites Dean to Camp David uh, and orders him to write uh, a comprehensive report on the entire cover-up. How it happened, um, who did what when, put everything in writing. And um, Dean, as, as, as I said, was a, a, a no stranger to the bad acts himself. And he uh, uh, correctly at uh, this point realizes that uh, Nixon is personally um, setting him up to be framed. Uh, Not framed because um, Dean was involved in every bit of this and uh, he he had the blood on his hands, certainly. But 
a Nixon was was going to set John Dean up to be the the, the mastermind, and um, it's it's uh, then at the end of March 1973 that uh, a, 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 a Dean flips, and um, he and Haldeman and uh, John Ehrlichman are. Uh, publicly fired, but a month or a, f- a few weeks after that anyway. And uh, in in May, uh, it, 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 a dean appears on international television and, and radio, transfixes the whole country. Uh, and um, it blows things wide open. And the other, his, his partner in, in, uh, doing that had 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 uh, his uh, not his partner but his his his, his the the equally uh, consequential the witness was of course Alexander Butterfield. Um, uh, uh, Butterfield was a colonel uh, in the U.S. Air Force. He's still alive, I believe. Um, and uh, he was not he was not a Nixon loyalist at all. Um, he was well, getting out of the military and he, he, he needed a job. And uh, he took uh, a position as a deputy White House a chief of staff. Um, he was generally the person that Richard Nixon saw most in his day. Um, Bob Holdeman himself was too busy actually running things. A Butterfield was with Nixon a lot, and a Butterfield never really. A Butterfield always held on to an incident um, that happened quite soon after he met a Richard Nixon. Nixon was a really awkward guy. Um, mm-hmm. I, I cannot overemphasize how how awkward and and socially inept he was. It 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 uh, makes his achievements in his life all the more unbelievable. Uh, he couldn't really function in crowds unless he he had rehearsed. Uh, if he was going to an event, he would uh, do homework on every person there, so he would have something to talk about. And uh, the exact circumstances es- escape me at the moment, but basically, uh, what happened was um, he he was alone in a room with a, a, a Butterfield and. Um, Nixon wouldn't say anything. He had nothing uh, to say. And the, uh, the atmosphere uh, became so uncomfortable that Nixon sensed it and he blew his top and he, and he, he, he threw a Butterfield out. Uh, he, he was rude to him. Um, uh, later on, he acted like nothing happened. That was his way. But a, a Butterfield was a, a good military man. He was loyal to his commander, but only uh, to a point. That didn't mean he had to uh, like him, and he certainly was not going to lie for him. Um, so when a, a Butterfield came to testify, um, he had uh, made up his mind that if he was asked about the taping system in the White House, he 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 would not he he uh, would not perjure himself. Uh, and the uh, again, I apologize. The the exact circumstances of how he came to be asked escape me at that moment. But um, a Butterfield was asked. He told the truth, and for a a, a month. At least afterwards, uh, Rosemary Woods, uh, uh, Nixon's personal secretary, who had um, uh, uh, been with him at, at that point, uh, 25 years, um, uh, 
she would call Alexander Butterfield's house at night, a late at night, and awake him up and say, you bastard, you <laughs> son of a bitch. You <laughs> son of a bitch. Resonate you, with his right to die. The last greatest year. president this country has ever had. <laughs> a, a Rosemary Woods was a really, really fearsome woman who would have committed murder if Richard Nixon told her to. Uh, and um, Julie and Trisha knew her as part of the family. And she, uh, she, family, yeah. Yeah. she, she hounded Alexander Butterfield. She sounds very similar to Toby, if I'm being perfectly honest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I see, maybe. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but yeah, Alexander Butterfield was the one who revealed that the the taping system ex- ex- existed. But we we should also underline that John Dean basically told the Senate um, committee that after September he had informed Nixon about the cover up, and that Nixon from that point was very much involved in the cover-up. He was yes. involved in thinking about the money. He was involved in the, in, in the in sort of, dis- not in personally dispatching the cash payments, but he, he, he had discussed mm-hmm. executive uh, clemency. He had formulated the plan re- regarding the cover-up. So, yeah, once um, John D and Alexander Butterfield have their... The testimonies is a sense in which the, the president is very much dragged into the the whole issue of Watergate himself, and that from from that point, from once the the tapes, uh, the ideas of the tapes are, are out there, mm-hmm. the 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 story the story really takes off. You know, the, the the American people are very much attracted to the idea that what what are these tapes what are these tapes saying yep. it it becomes a major it becomes a major story it starts to grip the nation in a way that it, and it hadn't previously so around this time we got october 10th <laughs> completely unrelated to all this but we have spyro agnew resigning as vice president uh, amidst uh, bribery and income tax evasion charges and uh, Nixon nominates uh, Gerald Ford as vice president, and swore, uh, Ford is sworn in in December. October 19th, we have Nixon attempting a, a legal maneuver to avoid handing over the tapes uh, to to Cox, Archibald Cox. Um, and then October 20th, we have uh, what became known as Saturday Night Massacre. Uh, Justin, Toby, could we touch a little bit on Saturday Night Massacre and it's how it played out? Well, I mean, the, the, the Nixon really didn't want to... He had struggled with Archibald Cox on whether he was going to hand over his papers initially. And now he was struggling again on whether they they were going to release the tapes. They, there was they, there was an idea of a compromise where they would have someone come in and listen to the tapes and then that would be the only person that they would give um, the opportunity to listen to the taste. But Archibald Cox, Cox uh, that was. Person, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I should say that the the uh, compromise was um, uh, it was uh, suggested that it was going to be um, a, an a, a, a very a, a very old U.S a senator who was um who was famously hard of hearing yeah it was it was it john stennis it was john stennis yes yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Stan, and... it was the stennis compromise stennis was he was he's known as actually a quite great senator in his time but th- there was a thing about things just dying when they went to stennis like stennis was a he was a nixon loyalist and he basically killed um you know any any type of sort of big uh, investigations that came to his desk and there was the idea that so someone who was hard of hearing if, i mean nixon said it in the in the when he had the frost nixon interview but yeah he was hard of hearing but he he, he was definitely capable of <laughs> hearing the, the tapes but yeah it was it was a ploy basically to you know to, to cr- crush the 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 committee at, the, at that point by using stannis So as far as the the massacre itself, then I think Archibald Cox really he really 
he he Nixon did not like Archibald Cox because Archibald Cox he's been it's described by some people as a sort of a high wasp. He was like everything Nixon wasn't. He was a Harvard constitutional uh, law academic. Like he he was the. He was like, he, he was the, he was the, he was almost like a, a reflection of the the person Nixon was. And he was like Alger Hiss. He was like JFK. You know, it, it was almost like the perfect enemy had, had come out. And Nixon was very much he's, he's very much said he was like, this is executive privilege. I am not going to release the, um, these tapes. I don't, and I don't have to. And 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 from that point, Nixon started putting pressure on Richardson and other members of his staff to fire Archibald Cox because the special prosecutor was actually underneath, was within the scope of the, 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 the presidency. Even though Nixon couldn't fire him himself, he could delegate that responsibility to other people. Richardson was also everything that Richard Nixon was not. He was a, um, he was a rich guy from Boston. He was terribly good looking. Uh, he was a war hero. Um, he was a liberal East, Eastern Republican who, who came from money. Uh, and um, when he, he was appointed attorney general, uh, he and his deputy, uh, William Ruckelshaus, had promised the Senate Watergate Committee that... Um, if called upon, they would not interfere with the in, in investigation uh, in in standing up to Nixon regarding Archibald Cox. They were um, standing by a promise they had already made. Um, when they were sacked, uh, 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 this uh, uh, this left the. Uh, third in line at justice as, as being Robert Bork. Uh, and um, Richardson and uh, uh, Ruckel's house and, and, and Bork had prearranged that if uh, uh, Richardson and a uh, Ruckel's house were sacked, that Bork would stay in place to uh, prevent chaos. Uh, there had been has been rumors to this day that um, Bork was offered a judgeship or uh, a Supreme Court seat to remain loyal to Nixon. I've never found any evidence of that. Um, my understanding of it is that um, he had made a, a pact with his his two bosses that he he then stood by. So we've got the um, yeah we've got the massacre itself, and then just uh, about three or four weeks later, we have the famous "I'm not a crook" uh, press conference from Richard Nixon. So that that's heading towards 1973. We have the the, the tapes as we we've touched on. Um, there's obviously the the existence of this 18 and a half minute gap on the, the Nixon Holderman conversation from 72 and uh, the White House unable to explain the gap. Um, any speculation on uh, what that might be, gentlemen? Any, uh, uh, some say it was actually... I mean, the, the, this, before that, you have the, the a new spe- special prosecutor brought in, mm-hmm. Le- Leo, Leon Jaworski, who was yep. from the South, who was known as someone who was particularly establishment. He had been a Nixon supporter. So Archibald Cox's own staff were immediately skeptical of him. But Jaworski came and Jaworski, he had a sense of, 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 of you know, he was a civil servant. He, he wanted to, 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 to represent his, his uh, in, in, a, in a, he wanted to be involved in things that, were of, of national significance. So the idea that he actually was a partisan Nixon figure was quick, quickly dispelled because he didn't even bring his staff mm-hmm. when he came to see Cox's uh, young, young, young group of lawyers. And he, and he, and he really was able to uh, take over this team and to reassure them 
that he was not a a sort of a Nixon figure like m- many other figures in the story had 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 been. Regarding the eighteen and a half a minute gap, I um I've always been of the opinion it happened by accident, and I'll I'll tell you why. Right. Uh, in context, it really d- doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, the tapes, as they are, are chock full of incriminating things. Um, there is no reason why one section uh, uh, should be gone and the others remain. Nixon later said he, he should have burned uh, the tapes, but he didn't. Uh, he felt that the president uh, couldn't be seen to uh, do that. Uh, he also once uh, uh, gave an order to Bob Haldeman to, um, uh, he phrased it to retain what he would need for his memoirs and the, uh, 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 get rid of the, the I'll, uh, I'll try that again. Um, mm-hmm. A Nixon once gave an order to Bob Haldeman to retain what he would need of, of uh, retain what he would need of, of the tapes for his memoirs and get rid of the rest. And Haldeman didn't do it because he 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 didn't want to be hung on an obstruction of justice charge. So um, Nixon kept with the tapes intact essentially except f- for that one section and there is more than enough there to hang him a thousand times over and what i i uh, believe happened was was that um a, a nixon uh, we know s- spent a lot of time alone uh, with uh, the tapes um he would go over them and go over them and would go over them at night as a good lawyer would trying to build a case uh, 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 trying to find a way through um and he was famously technically really inept um the a recorder was hard to use um and his secretary, uh, Rosemary Woods, uh, testified that she could have caused up to five minutes of, of the erasure because she said that, uh, again, the a recorder was quite uh, cumbersome. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but the analysis of the erasure um, uh, uh, said there were eight or nine separate erasures within that period. So what I really think happened was that uh, Nixon was alone in the middle of the night uh, and uh, 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 whether out of frustration or pure not knowing uh, uh, what button to press, uh, mm-hmm. he he just made a gap in, in, in these tapes because it, it really doesn't make sense otherwise. See, I would just like to clarify as well for those that are speculating. There's no evidence to say that eighteen and a half minutes was actually Toby's job interview because I know that. <laughs> happened so there, there is no evidence to support that. I, I think what... the difficulty with the tapes is it's it's a tape of an early conversation with Nixon and Holderman just after um, they they found out about the Watergate and then they started discussing. So I mean, once they started discussing Watergate on the tape, then then you have the erasure. So yeah. for the prosecutors, it was really they 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 saw that this erasure as potentially part of a bigger impeachment case. Mm-hmm. And Rosemary Woods, when she was put up on the stand, she had to actually try because the the the, the tape was worked on on the foot pedal, and Rosemary Woods sat on because she she sometimes would take dictation, or but or that she would press her foot down in order to stop the tape and she said that she had a call and then she stretched all the way in order to catch the call and and 
kept her foot on the on the on the, on the pedal. But when she tried it in the court, it didn't work. But then she said, "No, no, look, look, um, it doesn't work like that in my office." So she went to, your, to her office and she tried it tried it there, and she managed through you know painful with white knuckles managed to do it and so no one was really prosecuted on on the erasure of the tape so you know some people think there's, there's only three people's rosemary wood nixon and then one other official but the other but because the tape had been stopped so many times they felt that the other official couldn't have done it and it, it, it was it, it really was either Rosemary Woods or or Nixon himself, but no one was prosecuted because of the erasure of the tape. But it was, I mean, I mean, in the eyes of the public, it, it was mm -hmm. it, it basically game for for Nixon at that point. Yeah, I, I will say that um, Rosemary Woods uh, is is not was not involved in the cover-up. She was kept separate from this uh, uh, by Nixon. She didn't know uh, 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 much anyway. She should have been. She probably would have killed Liddy. I mean... Exactly, <laughs> exactly right. She was the toughest one out of all of them. Um, uh, uh, but Nixon would not have ordered her to uh, destroy evidence. He wouldn't have put her in that in that tough place. Um, the other possibility, as as you allude to, is that it's not out of the realm of possibility that Rosemary Woods uh, heard something on the tape that she didn't like and thought she was uh, protecting her boss in a uh, in a, a weak moment. But um, as you say, it could have only been Richard Nixon himself or or her. So just looking ahead now. Um into 74 we have the um indictments against the watergate 7 so we'll just touch on a little bit there and then we'll look ahead to the um the, the transcripts of the tapes and ultimately leading to richard nixon's resignation in august 74 so uh just a a, a brief a brief uh, overview of, of what the watergate 7 was and uh who was involved in that i just before I have to say that once Leo Jaworski had listened to the to the tapes, the tapes that they had, even before Nixon had released his own transcripts of the tapes, he had basically decided himself that Nixon was uh, not going to be able to stay. Jaworski told Haig that they needed to get the best trial lawyer, lawyer that they could because Nixon was basically going to be... He, he thought Nixon was going to be impeached. And then the the special prosecutor actually had a group of... Uh, a grand jury set up, and those people on the grand jury listened. They, they, took the, they listened to testimony. They took their notes. And basically, at the end of that grand jury, the grand jury was, was sealed. The grand jury had nothing to do with Nixon's impeachment, although... I suppose they, the um, prosecutor's office sent what had happened to the Judiciary Committee that eventually indicted um, members of the, the Watergate 7. But the, the grand, in the grand jury, all of the members of the grand jury, these were citizens, these were not lawyers, they all put their hands up. Some people put their hands up twice to say that Nixon was definitely um, guilty of the crime and should be indicted. Although it did, it, Nixon was not indicted while he was um, he was impeached, but he was he obviously couldn't be indicted. So um, yeah, that's what that, that's what what happened at the end. That's really the end of the story of the tapes. So let's move on to later in seventy four when we have the uh, transcripts of the Nixon tapes uh, being released by the White House. Um, and the uh, Supreme Court ruling that Nixon must surrender dozens of original tapes uh, to Jarofsky. Can we talk a little bit how that plays out and then how that eventually leads to Nixon's resignation in August 74? I mean, Nixon didn't want, really want to release the tapes. And what he did instead of releasing all of the tapes was to create just to create a transcription of the tapes. And um, people, Z Ziegler and Pat Buchanan, they worked on it with Nixon. And Nixon, um, basically, he listened to the tapes 
and then he made his own sort of um, corrections of the tapes, with the t- that, which were different from the tapes, and and they were they were different from the tapes that the the special prosecutor had. The the, the pe- members of the special prosecution team knew that there was a, there was a clear difference between the tapes they had and what Nixon had had written in, and the, but what Nixon had written was produced it was sold in shops around the country people re- people um looked at it they they saw i mean they, they basically i mean there's a reason why nixon not only nixon was nixon scared about um you know the the, the actual things about what he had done and his obstruction of justice coming out he was also terrified that they would paint a picture of the presidency that you know because nixon had prided himself on basically being similar sort of like he was the representative of the the great silent majority and all of the expletives all of the 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 things he's he said about different people they painted them in a really quite dark light and and, and i think and i think this is part of the reason why we look at this decade is is really like um as as is really like a fall from a sort of innocence for the American people because this the this, the 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 transcripts really bear, bore out what the president was about what what all this these whole institutions that they prided themselves on they 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 seem to be occupied by a pa- paranoid and quite disgusting individual and I think that 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 I think that further winnowed away nixon's um salience with the with the general with the general general public i mean initially nixon was did not want to give the tapes but the supreme court voted an eight to zero hit, um ruling that that nixon actually had to give off the give away the tapes as well as opposed to just releasing a a, a, a transcription of of the, the tapes uh, Justin, anything on the uh, release of the tapes uh, and then leading up to uh, the resignation of Nixon? A few thoughts. Um, what happened was, of course, uh, there was the case in the Supreme Court, the U.S. v. Nixon, in which it, 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 Nixon argued that the, the tapes were his personal property and that to release them would... Um, uh, explode the concept of executive privilege. Uh, he lost uh, unanimously, um, uh, and he uh, uh, turned the tapes over. And uh, one tape in in a particular, uh, which has uh, become known as the smoking gun, um, proved uh, uh, beyond the shadow of a doubt that. Uh, uh, Richard Nixon was was in the in the heart of this, and on this tape, he he's heard he's heard uh, uh, giving orders to his men to obstruct justice, to um, uh, uh, get on to the heads of the FBI and the CIA, and um, uh, 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 construct a, a cover story, and um, I uh, get these. Uh, the heads of the uh, law enforcement and uh, intelligence agencies to uh, do his dirty work uh, for him. And um, uh, once that happened, there was, there was no hope. It was um, a matter of time that, that, uh, that was on August the 5th, mm-hmm. 1974. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, Nixon later said that uh, he knew as as early as a uh, 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 July the twenty third that he could not uh, uh, survive. That, uh, that is when it was clear that the the, uh, uh, the House w- um, would vote to impeach. Uh, he responded uh, uh, by. Um, Sitting down with a, a a yellow legal pad as was his way, and he um, a, a made a, a a list of pros and cons. Um, his, his options, as he saw them, were he could resign now, 
Uh, he could wait to be impeached in the House and uh, resign uh, then, or he could s- stand trial in the Senate and try his luck. Mm-hmm. Um, that, in his estimation, would take at least the the uh, uh, rest of the year, if if not more. Mm-hmm. And um, he was quite serious in his resignation speech when he said he'd never been a quitter. Uh, that to to uh, resign at that point was against every instinct he had, and uh, he thought it would be an in- admission of guilt, which it was. <laughs> and and uh, he 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 was worried about the precedent it would it would set uh, for the future as well um he he didn't want the presidency to be something that um people felt that uh, uh, they could quit um but he he always knew that standing trial in 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 the uh a Senate was was not a viable option. Uh, he 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 knew that even if if he won, um, he would be a politically crippled, mm-hmm. um, and he he also knew that um, it would inflict horrible damage on the country. Um, uh, he. At that point, there had not been an impeachment trial in 110 years. Uh, no one alive had had any precedent of it or concept of it. And um, he, he did not want to be uh, the one to uh, uh, put America through that. Um, so when the smoking gun came out, uh, he gathered his family um, it was uh, himself, Mrs. Nixon, Patricia, uh, Julie, Bibi Rubozo, and Rosemary Woods. Yeah, and, shout out uh, to Rubozo. Yes. <laughs> he, he came up, up, up from Florida. And uh, he took all of their opinions and... Uh, Rebozo was the one he told first that he was going to resign. And um, Rebozo, uh, he was cut, he had a, a sort of olive a complexion. He was a Cuban by extraction. And, and Nixon said later that he turned white. And mm-hmm. uh, he, he told President Nixon, he said, you can't do it. You can't, you can't. And, and, and Nixon insisted, and um, he asked that uh, Rebozo help him uh, with his family. And they met, uh, they met upstairs in, in the, uh, in the uh, Lincoln bedroom in the White House. And um, uh, uh, Nixon had the, a, a transcript of the smoking gun uh, brought over and he uh, read it out loud to them. Mm-hmm. And um, they all knew at that point that all, all, all was lost. Uh, but he pointed out that even if the smoking gun had never existed, he had still intended to resign um, uh, because he was a, a determined to go out ahead of, of being impeached. He he was not impeached. Or the House never voted to uh, uh, to impeach him. He he resigned uh, before he could be impeached. So um, uh, once that was settled, uh, he uh, gathered his family and uh, BB and uh, Rosemary Woods, and they uh, went for a final cruise on the presidential yacht, the Sequoia up mm-hmm. and down the Potomac River. And um, uh, they had a nice time, as as he put it. And uh, 
of that night, he was in his cabin up below deck, and Rosemary Woods uh, brought him the messages or reactions to the smoking gun uh, tape. And uh, he had a hard time with that because it was it was now he he realized all of his his old allies were abandoning him and that they they could no longer stand by him. So he um, took these messages and he thanked Rosemary Woods and he shut the door and he turned the light off and he closed his eyes. Well, that was a really nicely detailed uh, sort of end of the Nixon era. I mean, uh, Toby, I hope you're not crying too hard on, on, as, you, as you hear those words. Uh, so for the timeline then... I'm as the... passionate, man. <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay, Toby, it's okay. Nick, Nixon li- lives on in all of us, it's okay. Yes, uh, he does. <laughs> so August 8th, 1974. You know, Nixon's favourite movie was Around the World in 80 Days. He loved the elephant. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that 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 was emotional. That 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 really was tough. Um. So yes, August eighth, nineteen seventy four. It's okay, Toby. It's okay. August eighth, nineteen seventy four. Nixon resigns. Uh, the next day, he uh, officially signs the letter of resignation, and uh, President uh, Gerald Ford, well, Vice President Gerald Ford, becomes president. Uh, in September, we have uh, Gerald Ford uh, pardoning him of any uh, offences, and then in January 1975, we kind of have a, a closed loop on this with former Chief of Staff Holderman, former Domestic Policy Advisor John uh, Enrockman, and former Attorney General Nixon Campaign Manager John Mitchell are tried and convicted of conspiracy charges arising from Watergate, and in total, 41 people uh, received criminal convictions related to the Watergate scandal. So that is the uh, that is Watergate. That is there is obviously so much more that could be said about it. We we've only had just over an hour to talk about it, and we've obviously had to try and console Toby along the way as we've gotten closer and closer to the resignation. I, I think we we should probably just touch on Nixon's legacy as well. Sure. We So we are looking to do in, in the future a, a sort of bonus episode on Nixon because we're always looking to do bonus episodes on Nixon where we'll uh, discuss a little bit about uh, his kind of years afterwards and the Frost Nixon and uh, uh, those kind of things. But yeah, j- let's just very briefly in the last couple of minutes on the show just can maybe tie up how when, when you think of Nixon there's maybe two or three things you think of and Watergate is probably the first one. How do you think how do you think today we still think of, of Nixon in regards to his sort of time as a politician in general compared to I, the specific like, Watergate? Approximately, and like in the the immediate period, like, and I, Justin has touched on this, like, with Nixon alienating the CIA because he had made the office of um, of of Henry Kissinger, who was a you know very close to to him, much more powerful. In, in the foreign policy, he had alienated the Justice Department in his trips to to China by by keeping them out. He he had alienated the FBI. He alienated Congress. He alienated Congress because Nixon's domestic policies. You know, Nixon said things like "I'm a Keynesian," in in and he he introduced wage and price controls. He 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 had a foreign policy with um, rapprochement with China. That alienated people like um, like the, the Goldwater. So when when he he came to he, he had a group of like a very right wing congressman, and he asked them, you know, like if there was a trial in the Senate, like w- you know what would happen? And and Goldwater told him like oh, there's only like twelve twelve people who would even consider consider an acquittal of you. And so Nixon really had alienated all of these departments. Part of it was his personality, but another part of it is, is what Arthur Schlesinger Jr. is called the imperial presidency. And I think both Nixon and, and another person who'd won a great sweeping majority, who we started this whole um, trilogy with, is Lyndon Johnson, both of them had amassed so much power in the executive branch. And this is a period where Americans were becoming more and more skeptical of 
power. I mean, this is this is. I mean, Nixon was a colossus as as a, as a political individual. If you compare him to the presidents afterwards, Carter, Ford, and even Reagan, they they, they just didn't amass the same amount of power. And and I and I and I think really, in the immediate period, it it is. And you know like, things that he used, like he tried to use executive clemency. He he, he thought about pardonings. Those instruments of the 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 the, the executive of the, of of the of the the imperial president were really cut asunder in this period. And it's interesting to see how that's flipped. I mean, it, one spine of what we're seeing in America right now is um, a hunger. Well, I won't say hunger. The spine of what we're seeing in America right now is exactly that. Um, President Trump is doing even things that Richard Nixon maybe wanted to do, but realized that the president um, could not do, could not be seen to do. Uh, And there is a large segment of the population that, who doesn't care. Um, I will say as well, uh, one thing that my portrayal of of President Nixon has taught me, um, I was not prepared for the reactions to him from young people. Um, I was ready for them to be indifferent or to turn up their noses at him. Uh, in a lot of ways, the opposite is true. Uh, they see him in some sense as no better or worse than anyone else. All politicians are crooks. Uh, but he was, uh, he was a gangster. He was Al Capone. He was effective. Um, I'm not, I'm not saying I feel that way, but, uh, this is an attitude that I run into again and again that, yeah and, and john dean even says you know when he's talking in like he says we don't have any way of washing money like this is not what we do we're not criminals this is what mob people do and i think that's the impression that like as you talked about is that we get that young people get from nixon and probably i got from nixon is that this this he's like he's kind of cool he's a gangster he's not he's, <laughs> he doesn't come across as as I mean, you're, you're these, there's a southern strategy, there's things like that. It doesn't come across as a particularly ideological figure, much more as a, as a sort of a flawed criminal figure, in, in my impression of him. He, he was not a terribly ideological figure in most senses, no. He was a small C conservative who was the last national a republican politician to uh, believe that a, 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 um, a government had a place in 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 helping people um he w- he was not a liberal as he's sometimes a- accused of of being but he had no truck with this goldwater reagan a, a, a branch of a conservatism what that um the only a good government is one that you drown in the bathtub. Um, He believed that the instruments of the federal government mattered in people's daily lives. And um, he uh, uh, believed that America could be, was, and must be the keystone of peace around the world. Um, and the alliances that he forged, uh, especially in China and the Middle East, um, preserved peace for the most part for a generation. Uh, he certainly had his catastrophic failures in that. Um, he uh, uh, destroyed much of the civilization in South America, for example. Uh, 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 but his 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 f- foreign policy successes, as you said earlier, are to be admired. And um, no president since then uh, has even attempted a foreign policy on that scale. Yeah, you know they killed Allende, they they bombed Cambodia, they got Cam- 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 Rouge, uh, is the 
the shadow of the Nixon president. Exactly. So, yeah, a lot of terrible things. But I also think that there's a sense in which this president, like he, he liked to read read about 18th or 19th century British president um, prime ministers like Disraeli and Gladstone. There was a sense in which it, it was a conservatism that he had, but it was a conservatism that sort of because sort of felt that, that that there was a society that um, people in power had some sort of, um, you know, the, the duty to the common folk. And he built, I think he built that 1972, obviously there was all these dirty tricks they used to, in part to do it, but he built that 1972 silent majority consensus because he was the person who best was able to understand where the public was. And he, and he did it in this sort of Disraeli style I think I think this is all. It all comes down to this, this idea that he was this sort of, I mean, this obel- obelisk. You know, he was this this huge, hulking executive figure that we, you know, we really haven't had since in many ways, and 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 and, and he built that by really having a co- connection with the with the with the vast population. It, it's really the politicians. And the the agencies, Congress, um, the FBI, all, all of the, the 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 kinds of all of the parts of the government that are that are meant to be checks on executive power, that really despised him and really ultimately brought him down. And uh, sorry, guys, probably going to have to cut you off there since that's an hour and a half now. Which I mean, to be honest, an hour and a half talking about Richard Nixon is nowhere near enough, but. Um, we Could should... I say one more thing? It's quite uh, absolutely, abusive. Justin. Absolutely, it, it 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 may be it may be of use. Um, I I will just say that Richard Nixon's great genius was, as Toby alluded to, he knew where the public was going before they did. Um, a, a, a two instances of that, he says in an interview with. Uh, Jet magazine in 1966 or 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 seven that the Republican Party cannot uh, be allowed to uh, become an all white party that um, if the essentially white nationalist forces of the far right are allowed in uh, it will ruin the Republican Party's uh, power and and prospects eventually, which is something that you're running into now. Um, he also says in 1992 in private that um, so many people are gay or go both ways. I don't care. And that is not something that you hear f- from the Nixon of, of 1970 on, on tape. Uh, I'm not sure if he really felt that way in his personal life, I don't know, but he was speaking in a political sense that um, if you don't let minorities in the door, if you campaign as a party of exclusion, you're doomed and the country is doomed. Well, I mean, prophetic words there from Nixon, I suppose. I mean, you, you only have to look at how the political landscape has shifted from uh, even when I was younger. You know, you, you look at uh, George W. Bush campaigning against uh, no to gay marriage, and now you have uh, even probably the most uh, staunch uh, conservative is probably willing to accept that coming out against gay marriage, uh, at least on a national level, is probably not going to win them too many favors. So, um, as always, we should listen to Mr. Nixon. Um, <laughs> uh, that's all for today's episode. Thank you so much to Toby and to Justin uh, for joining me today. It's been such a pleasure to be able to talk. Uh, Justin, thank you so much, so much for joining us and uh, for uh, I- enjoying enjoying bathing in the the warming glow of Richard Nixon. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, gentlemen. And, I'm kind of present for this one, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just just to remind you all, if you would like to. Uh, uh, continue to uh, bathe in the warm glow of Richard Nixon. You can follow follow Justin and uh, Mr. Nixon himself at at, uh, at Dick underscore Nixon on Twitter. And uh, please uh, please also review and subscribe our uh, podcast on iTunes. And you can follow us on Twitter at uh, USA Impressions. So from Toby, Justin, President Richard Nixon, and myself, Simon, thank you very much for listening. Goodbye. Bye. See you. Bye bye.
I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. America needs a full-time president and a full-time Congress, particularly at this time with problems we face at home and abroad. To continue to fight through the months ahead for my personal vindication would almost totally absorb the time and attention of both the president and the Congress in a period when our entire focus should be on the great issues of peace abroad and prosperity without inflation at home. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office.